I want to take you to a public housing complex in Southeast DC that was known for its house parties, rappers, and most of all, the brutality from gang members who were also residents. The Benning Terrace Projects is simply known as Simple City. This public housing project has become infamous not only for its poverty, but because of its multiple homicide cases. Lots of cases were closed not because they were solved, but because the suspect himself was executed in another case of violence. This infamous honor of most dangerous was earned in the 1990s. The crime was slowly escalating since the 1970s, but the crime was so bad in the 1990s that homeowners nailed their windows shut and used large china cabinets to block the back doors for fear of intruders or stray projectiles. Cab driver Richard Johnson was found lying next to a phone booth with an open wound to the back of his head. Police reported that his mistake was insisting that he drop off his fare at the bottom of the hill instead of driving him into the complex. Police ID'd 18-year-old Johnny Lee Simpson Jr. from the Simple City crew. In an affidavit, police said a witness overheard Simpson bragging about it by saying, I just bust this cab driver because he was faking on me. I paid him. He wouldn't bring me up the hill. Simpson was jailed and charged along with charges on two other cases of homicide. In all cases, the victim's wounds were to the head. Simpson's nickname was Benji, and among prosecutors he gained the nickname Back of the Head Benji. Two men tried to rob an ice cream man, Bright Anuha, a favorite ice cream truck that would allow you to buy candy on credit. He resisted the two men and he lost his life. Two Simple City crew members were convicted of the crime. Homicides happened monthly in Simple City, but the assassination of 12-year-old Daryl Hall sent shockwaves through the city. Daryl was snatched off the street on his way home from school on a cold day in January 1997. His case spurred on the police and the public in action of a way that the older victims could not. The police believe infighting from cliques inside the Simple City crew was responsible for all the deaths that finally resulted in the loss of 12-year-old Daryl Hall. Prosecutors said the pace escalated when 26-year-old Gary Washington was slain as he left a funeral home on 50th Street and Nanny Helen Burroughs Avenue where he had gone to pay for funeral services of his slain relative. Clarence Taylor. Taylor was also a member of the Circle Crew and he was taken out while he was sitting on his front porch. A man walked up behind him and aimed at the back of his head. A second person opened fire striking his body. Taylor's slaying took place just hours after another member of the Circle Crew was hit and wounded. Gary Washington died four days after Clarence Taylor. U.S. Attorney Eric Holder said it was the most publicized slang in a neighborhood with a long history of violence. He also said the nature of the violence is shocking. The amount of violence is shocking. And the period of time over which it has occurred is shocking. The violence is random in some ways, but personal in some ways. A lot of it is just settling beefs, settling scores. Now that the attention that was given to young Daryl Hall's slang has put gang violence back on the front burner in D.C. The police department dedicated 50 additional officers to a citywide attack on gang violence. The police said that the stepped up presence of its officers established a deterrent force that was never there before and it contributes to the new calm. But law enforcement sources said they were concerned that the violence will resume as people were being arrested for earlier crimes. Eric Holder especially had to put extra manpower into cracking down on the Simple City crew. 
the slaying of 12 year old Daryl Hall was the latest in a series of nine lives that were taken that police say they believe were all tied to fighting within the Simple City crew. Police said the violence began spring of 1996 when the gang of Simple City split into two. One group known as the Alabama Avenue Crew and the other as the Circle Crew. Alabama Avenue is a street that runs through the Ben and Terrace projects and the Circle is a cul-de-sac that lay inside the Benning Terrace projects on 46th Place and G Street. Five members of the circle and three from the avenue along with a bystander were massacred. Daryl Hall who investigators said was associated with the Alabama Avenue crew was abducted with a muzzle pointed to his head and taken to a ravine near the 800 block of Burn Street Southeast, just blocks away from Ben and Terrace. He was popped in the head and the body. Police said he apparently was snuffed out in retaliation for a hit on the members of the Circle Crew. Four members were arrested on first degree charges. The Eastgate crew was now neutralized because most of Eastgate housing projects was empty with boards on the windows and demolition started the next year in 1998. Without a constant threat of the Eastgate crew, the Simple City crew split into cliques that then turned on each other. The police said that the cycle of retaliation produced an extraordinary amount of violence that left Daryl Hall the ninth person in nine months assassinated from a spree of infighting. Most of the victims were in their late teens or early 20s. The police said that once the guy was no longer living, everybody had no problem saying what they did. The residents of Simple City and the surrounding neighborhoods had to live like they were survivors of war. The very first week of January 1997, multiple people called the police every day because they heard bang 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 every day. With just a few days of peace, Daryl Hall was found on the 15th. Children of any age were never safe. One hot day in June 1993, a Simple City crew member sprayed a public swimming pool at Benning Park Recreational Center with a semi-automatic sending six children to the hospital, ranging in age from five years old to 14. The crew was looking for a rival from the Eastgate crew, and it turned out he wasn't even there at the time. The event was national news, and President Bill Clinton condemned it. The hit at the crowded Benin Park pool during the summer was a spur-of-the-moment act for a retaliation with the Eastgate crew, that started in 1991, according to a crew member and the police investigators who questioned him. It was about 200 or more people at the pool, and they were mostly children. 10 or 20 pops were fired into the pool around 2 p.m., having everybody scrambling. Four armed Simple City crew members went to the pool to fire up the whole junk because a boy from the neighborhood that was there at the pool earlier said that an Eastgate enemy was at the pool. The same crew member recalling the story for the police said he found out about the attack on the evening TV news saying, I didn't think they were going to do it. I said, damn, they did it. But to the rest of the Simple City crew members, it was just another hit. It was always said that neither he nor any other crew member gave it much thought. It wasn't a big deal around here. They do stuff like that all the time. Somebody's getting popped all the time. They don't really affect me though, he said. The Washington Post wouldn't ID the teenager in the article, and detectives verified everything he said to a reporter. One investigator said the teen has helped detectives close three or four cases based on his information. The suspect, a 14-year-old boy, turned himself into police and was charged with six counts of assault with intent. A 17-year-old boy, described by police as an accomplice, 
was arrested and charged with one count of assault with intent. Both were charged as juveniles. The crew member and detectives describe how the feud with the Eastgate crew began in 1991. It's when 17-year-old Alfonso Capers from the Eastgate crew was fatally taken down in the 4400 block of F Street Southeast. An investigator explained it as Alfonso Capers was in an argument with the brother of someone associated with the Simple City crew. The case was closed after the suspected assassin was assassinated because of the Simple City Eastgate tit for tat. But the feud intensified one year later when 19 year old Channel Rucker of the 400 block of Burbank Street Southeast his body was found in the 4800 block of Benning Road. Rucker was a member of the Simple City crew. The informant crew member said, Once that happened, everything went wacko. Shortly after Rucker was hit, a Simple City crew member told his friends that he had took out Rucker accidentally while they were aiming and taking shots at the Eastgate crew. That didn't seem to matter to them though. The Simple City crew wanted revenge, the teenager said. He also said, they're a little stupid. They just want an excuse to keep something going. Police officers said that as crew members watched friends pass away, some of them grew some sort of bloodlust as well as the conviction that they didn't have long to live anyway. Some started wearing bulletproof vests every day. And just to make sure that the victim wouldn't live to testify, the crew learned to pop people in the head. During all the warfare with the Eastgate crew, according to prosecutors, some simple city members hung shoes on the power line on 46th Street in the middle of the neighborhood, each pair representing someone that was slain and laid to rest. So many shoes hung there that at one point, the power line sagged in the middle from all the weight, then the power company had to come and repair it. Assistant U.S. Attorney Michael Britton said that the bloodshed decreased in 1994, only after the Eastgate crew leaders were either in prison or no longer living. D.C.'s public housing agency also was gradually shutting down the Eastgate projects. The saddest fact about the crew is that they're drawing younger and younger kids into the chaos. Crime specialists cite several causes for the rise of manslaughter among young people. They include the breakdown of the family unit. The criminal gang has become an alternative to family and have the influence of the drug trade. Many people imagine gangs to be highly organized, militaristic groups whose purpose in life is to commit crimes such as dealing illegal substances. That picture may be true in some places, but not in Simple City. They're not master criminals. A crime specialist said, the reality is that they are loosely structured. These groups don't start out with crime in mind. They begin as identity groups. The boys in the neighborhood hang out together or grew up together. Many of them, but not all, eventually turn to low-level crime. A lot of these kids are people who have just gone to school together. They have established relationships and grow fond of each other. These boys didn't just so happen to get together. The sense of cohesion forms and having a turf to protect can grow more powerful when crews develop a rivalry with crews from other neighborhoods. And many of the crimes are moments of passion or sudden opportunity that occur in broad daylight in front of witnesses. But those witnesses usually live in the same neighborhood and have strong reasons to not get on the bad side of anybody in the crew. That's why many people refuse to cooperate with the police. The two gangs, the Circle and the Avenue, would stand at either side of the neighborhood football field and throw threats and curses across the field for minutes at a time. This was the signal to the residents that they had five or ten minutes to run for shelter before the bullets began to fly. Miss Ellen, a resident who lives next to the field, 
said that she and her family were indoors most days before 3 p.m., although the shooting could start as early as 11 a.m. They hadn't used her living room in two years. Her patio door, which was next to the playground, still had a hole in it. The projectile missed her daughter by inches. Miss Ellen used to watch her loudmouthed young neighbors pass by her bedroom window carrying weapons. All she could do was draw the curtains. David Gilmore, the court-appointed supervisor over DC's Public Housing Authority, tried to inspect Benning Terrace, but his driver refused to drive into the heart of the projects. What he could see from the moving car, he felt was significant enough. Groups of young men, neither at work nor in school, despite the hour of the day, stood alert as if they were posted in a position in these thick starter jackets, despite the heat of the midday. They presided over an open-air drug market in a project's cul-de-sac, with 40-ounce malt liquor bottles and drug paraphernalia in plain sight. Mr. Gilmore didn't mind admitting that they scared him. As he drove away, there was no missing the warning sign among the graffiti written on the simple city walls. You are now in the war zone. Mr. Gilmore reviewed the crime statistics, the unpaid rent, and the maintenance reports describing the never-ending vandalism. He concluded that Bending Terrace was a lost cause, and some of the buildings had to be knocked down. But the news of a 12-year-old boy named Darrell Hall being abducted in broad daylight and found days later, beaten, executed, and frozen so solid that it took days to thaw his body for autopsy. This was shocking, but another news report changed everything for Mr. Gilmore. This news made him suspend his demolition plan. The gangs had made peace. Overnight, it seemed, the gangsters traded in their weapons for paintbrushes, their drug dealing for manual labor, their nihilism for community spirit. They traded one identity and one destiny for its exact opposite. A small group of 50-something-year-old men who considered themselves middle-aged survivors in 1991 were hanging out with their friend Tyrone Parker in his beauty shop in the suburb of Capitol Heights, Maryland, less than two miles from Simple City. Most of them were former criminals, substance abusers, or both. They had rehabilitated themselves and one another through a string of interventions and religious awakenings that they were hard-pressed to recreate in their old age. Having survived being locked up and being in the streets, they had become increasingly saddened by the dark cloud of grief in their D.C. hometown. Parker, a reformed bank robber turned parole officer, thought about it especially after losing a son to the same type of brutality. As they sat among the hair dryers at the shop Parker owned, the group's after-hours sports talk kept returning to talk of the community, eventually calling themselves the Alliance of Concerned Men. They decided to do something about it. Alliance member Eric Johnson said, We were doing it without a plan, an office, a budget, a computer, or an agenda. Johnson was a recovering substance abuser who worked as a printer for the Treasury Department. Alliance member Pete Jackson explained that the group's goal was ambitious to reduce D.C.'s homicides by 50% in two years, and to make this a city where a woman could forget her pocketbook at the bus stop in the morning and find it still there when she came back for it after work. The Alliance has grown to include more men, with and without criminal pasts, but its mission still remained the same, working from their cars on their own time, at their own expense, and putting themselves in personal jeopardy they went to the trouble spots looking for clusters of young men and talking to them. We'd never tell them what they're doing wrong, said Mr. Jackson, who himself has progressed from inmate to deputy warden at a nearby prison. They didn't denigrate anybody's father. 
even the most absent ones. Instead, they started a program to transport 15 to 30 kids a week to visit their fathers in prison. The Alliance members never threatened the young men with any type of punishment because they knew from their own youthful experiences with ministers and police that such interventions could be counterproductive. More so, they believed that these young men knew what they were doing was wrong. What they didn't know was how to stop. The Alliance was determined to ask the gangs in Simple City what would it take for them to stop. Working with local officials, they quickly identified the leaders of the rival crews and hunted them down in the dark, trashy hallways of Simple City. Alliance member James Osselbrook, a recovering alcoholic turned car salesman, said of the danger that they faced, We trust in God. Angels go in with us. Within a week of running the dangerous gauntlet between territories, Alliance members got both sides to agree to meet on neutral territory. Each agreed expecting the other not to cooperate. One unlikely peacemaker turned out to be Derek Ross, considered by law enforcement officials to be among the most dangerous men in DC. Ross has been suspected but not convicted of adult offenses. Those involved in the peace talks remember Ross, who at the time he was 24 years old, as being one of the most feared men in DC. Ross refused to attend the first two meetings, but he did show up for the third one. He scowled perpetually and refused to stand next to a rival from the Avenue crew in the prayer circle that began each meeting. Less than two weeks later, he would make the first unarmed, unprotected walk into a neighborhood war zone, an area off limits to both sides of the battlefield. He did it to demonstrate his faith in the truce and his commitment to his own personal rebirth. The journalist who interviewed Derek Ross commented that the scowling, dangerous man was now hard to detect because of his attitude change. Ross's tall frame was relaxed and his handsome face was rarely without a wide toothy grin. Gone are the designer clothes and the expensive sneakers. His new uniform became that of the common working man. He wore with pride his working boots, DC Housing Authority blues uniform, and a paint spattered DCHA parka. He grins even when he's exhausted from a long day of landscaping, renovating apartments, and maintaining facilities at Simple City. Ross said, I can live now. There wasn't nothing to smile at before. In 1981, at age 7, Ross had moved with his aunt and some siblings to Simple City. His father had recently passed away, and his mother was having a serious emotional crisis. At first, things went reasonably well, Ross said. I was a nerd until then, admitting to selling newspapers in DC's subway stations after school from 5th grade through 7th grade. At that point, the housing projects was well maintained and violence was relatively rare. Soon Ross's petty crimes became worse. He was vandalizing public and private property, handling weapons, and having multiple children with multiple women. Driving a car that wasn't his finally got him sent to jail for the first time. He served 11 months at a youth facility and 8 months at a group home. He said his lesson learned was don't get caught. After that he was in and out of detention until he was 18 years old. Six years later, Ross found himself the unmarried father of four children by four different women, a high school dropout living in a war zone. Long before the Alliance showed up, Ross wanted a way out. Not because of the devastation that illegal substances did on his community, and not because of the guilt. Ross said, I never thought about scaring people or people getting hurt or nothing. I was just doing what you do to survive in Benning Terrace. He wanted out because the risk to himself had become too much. 
He knew it was just a matter of time before he wound up in the cemetery or behind bars. What he didn't know was how to break the cycle. Judge just bring his gavel and you gone for 25, 30 years and it's all legal. We all wanted to stop, but wasn't no way you could go first. Someone you might have beat up in junior high school might come back one day and poof, you gone. Then the Alliance member showed up in Simple City. Ross said this while laughing. They kept trying to hug everybody. I knew they were cops just trying to scam us. Ross warned his friends to have nothing to do with the Alliance members, and yet he couldn't stay away from them. He couldn't pass up the free food and basketball games that they had arranged. At the truce talks, the Alliance members asked lots of questions, including a very difficult and obvious one. Why are you gunning for each other? No one could answer that question, but they could chronicle the escalation of the battles. No one could remember the initial disagreement with the other side. The Alliance focused the discussion towards life in the neighborhood, what they'd like to change about it, and how they could create change. The older men allowed the youngsters to name their own rules of conduct for the truce talks. No using the N-word, no profanity, no weapons, no interrupting each other, and no violence for the duration of the talks. At the first few meetings, the young men stood there, quiet and passive, while the Alliance members led them in prayer. Meetings after that, the young men took the lead. It was their own idea to increase the frequency of the meetings to twice a week, and to move the meetings to Simple City from the office of Robert Woodson, the head of a DC-based advocacy group. David Gilmore was following the story closely in the news. Two weeks into the peace talks, he offered to help. I knew they couldn't do it without the housing authority, he said. We were the landlords of most of the people involved. If people are dying in the streets, the housing industry has to be involved. Soon, the man who had planned to knock down their homes was calling the young men that he had feared his children, and they were calling him boss. Gilmore may not have had the street credibility of the Alliance members, but 30 years of running public housing, along with his training as a social worker, has taught him about the psyches of the long-term poor. Because of the news of young Daryl Hall, the anti-crime group, the Guardian Angels had announced plans to paint over the graffiti in Simple City as a symbol. Mad at the announcement, both gangs let it be known that they would not allow outsiders to do any such thing. In fact, new graffiti went up just to let the world know who controlled that area. Mr. Gilmore politely turned down the guardian angels. But then the young men confronted Mr. Gilmore, wanting to know why he didn't have the graffiti removed. To his credit, Mr. Gilmore didn't remind them who put it there in the first place or that he knew the request was a trap. Many of the tags were memorials to slain friends and removing them would be considered an act of war. Gilmore said, I'm not going to remove it, but you might want to. Gilmore agreed to pay for a six month graffiti removal project at $6.50 an hour. None of the young men objected to the offer of manual labor. They all claimed that contrary to public perception of males like them, they've always wanted to work but couldn't get jobs because of their criminal records and a lack of life skills. Within two weeks, the Alliance helped them get organized and produced a plan. All at once, these young men had what they wanted most, adult guidance, jobs, and a way out of street life. It was right about then that Derek Ross crossed the football field that no one played on. I knew it would never be real until somebody crossed over, Ross said. And then 36 young men went to work. As the Alliance members claimed, these young men didn't need anyone to tell them what they should do. Unprompted, they started the graffiti removal by taking down the declaration of the war zone. 
they taxed themselves from their own paychecks to build a basketball court for the younger boys and to have four cookouts. They showed up before their shifts to inspect the grounds and to pick up any trash. Then they ran the remaining drug dealers out of their projects. The same natural leadership that made him among the most dangerous men in DC, Ross then commanded respect by helping his neighborhood. When the younger males began dropping out of school to get jobs, Ross stopped them by developing a program that allowed them to work evenings part-time and on the weekend if they stayed in school. Ross completed his GED and attended a program at Catholic University training him to be a housing manager. Mr. Gilmore boasted that Ross scored among the highest of 450 applicants on an exam and interview. Why was the Alliance able to do what years of peace marches, intense policing, pleas from community groups, neighbors, relatives, ministers, and government programs couldn't do? The Alliance helped provide two missing things, jobs and direct involvement with the young men. Alliance member James Alsobrooks said, What usually goes on with these kids is all stick and no carrot. They'll go to jail if they break the law and they know that. But they don't see another way besides the streets. It's all they know. With the help of Mr. Gilmore and Robert Woodson, former gang members were working hard to maintain a good relationship with the police. The Metro Police Department, in turn, credits the Alliance and the jobs program with turning Simple City around. It's not trouble free, no, but not only is crime way down, the Alliance has greatly improved the quality of life. There's much less hanging on the corners, drinking and profanity. People feel safe again. The police couldn't have brought those kids together. About 65 young people were working through the Ben and Terrace Jobs Program. Mr. Gilmore contends the program has actually saved the government money because it has kept officials from having to raise the project and relocate all those residents. Private sector jobs followed after a jobs fair with hotels also offering employment. The Alliance helped the young men form a corporation, seeking construction contracts for renovating apartments. As far as gang colors, the Bloods may be biased towards the color red and the Crips the color blue, but in Simple City, the colors that matter are yellow for the full body workman slicker, blue for the blue uniform of the fraud time DCHA worker, and white for the most important of white shirts, which identifies you as a DCHA supervisor. After a four block anniversary peace march from the circle up to the avenue, former gang member LeJohn Watson literally ran to the pulpit of First Rock Baptist Church across the street from Simple City Apartments to claim his white shirt and wrap it around himself like a Superman cape. In his acceptance speech, he spoke of the value of the little things that were nonetheless monumental to him, such as his first driver's license. I can pull it out now if the police stop me. I don't have to be afraid because I'm legal, he boasted. Alliance members helped the young men register their cars for the first time and negotiate the insurance, health care, and child support payments. They bought them their first suits and gave mass tie-tying lessons before the awards banquet. The men of the Alliance hug, praise, and chastise when needed. We're training these men to go back out into the community as antibodies against the negativity in their environments by helping them purge profanity and drinking from their gatherings, said Mr. Jackson. While the community efforts in Benning Terrace were held for their remarkable results over the first few years, by the late 2000s, violence resurfaced. In 2008, newly elected D.C. Mayor Adrian Fenty pled support for the area by dedicating a new sports field and playground at the complex. But in March 2011, 13 young men living in Benning Terrace were indicted for violent crimes. Witnesses said 
they resumed old feuds that their uncles and older brothers already resolved. News channel WUSA 9 reported in 2019 a list of DC's public housing that desperately needed renovation or raising. DC Housing Authority Executive Director Tyrone Garrett compiled a list of seven public housing complexes that were considered so deplorable that they need to be completely demolished according to a draft development plan. The list includes Fort DuPont Edition, Greenleaf Edition, Greenleaf Gardens, Kelly Miller Dwellings, Richardson Dwellings, Stoddard Terrace, and Woodland Terrace. Of course I'll have to go visit all of these housing projects and take pictures before they're all knocked down. But Tyrone Garrett created a second list. The second list has eight public housing projects that would receive major renovations. And at the top of that list is Benning Terrace. Then there's Fort DuPont Dwellings, Garfield Senior Terrace, Judiciary House, Kelly Miller Dwellings Townhouses, Langston Edition, Langston Terrace, and LeDroit Apartments. DCHA has a hybrid plan to preserve and modernize the buildings on site that currently provide the best living conditions for residents, which are the townhouses along Alabama Avenue while redeveloping the rest of the property. Phase 1 is the redevelopment of the block to the east of 46th Street, which is shown on the site analysis map labeled the cul-de-sac, front street, and the courtyard. Significant regrading of the soil, new street alignments, and infrastructure are a part of this phase in order to allow for a loop street that will allow at least two ways in and out of this section. Phase two is to tackle the redevelopment of the portion of the block to the west of 46th Street. The area on the map labeled as the mid-rises. Phase two will allow for the creation of a traditional neighborhood design with street fronting townhouses and stacked flats. A new management office and community center is also planned for phase two. Phase three is the modernization of the townhouses along Alabama Avenue and F Street. Since this is the final phase of the renovation of Benning Terrace and completion of this phase is likely to extend out five to eight years. Capital money will be invested in these structures to keep them in as good a condition as possible until residents can be relocated in anticipation of the start of Phase 3. At least 2,600 families are expected to be displaced from all the housing projects on this list. Bending Terrace was built in 1958. The property consists of 274 housing units in eight three-story apartment buildings and 98 townhouses with two, three, four, and five bedrooms. Did you know that the name Simple City is not an official name of Benning Terrace? If you ask any DC resident where the nickname came from, they couldn't tell you. Whoever I asked said, that they have always known Simple City to be its name. I admit myself that I didn't know the name Benning Terrace as a child. I always knew it as Simple City and I lived blocks away in the Eastgate projects. I went to school with some of the kids from Simple City in the late 1970s and finally heard the name Benning Terrace when I became an adult. I didn't understand that the projects near Benning Road in the Benning Ridge neighborhood was called Benning Terrace. So where did the nickname Simple City come from? Let me show you this article from 1956 in the Evening Star. This article was for and about young people in DC. This article explains the teen slang spoken by black DC young people in the 1950s. 
Teenagers Ronald Sutton from Bell Vocational School and William Roberts from McKinley High School were among the teens interviewed and asked to describe and explain the meaning of the current Negro expressions. The slang term, that's boss, means something very good. Records are called sounds. And the insane asylum is called simple city. Or it was something tough or wicked. It was nice, but now it's wasted, meaning it's repulsive. And I'll say it again, that the term simple city was a slang term used by black teenagers in DC in the 1950s and it was considered an insane asylum or something repulsive. It was nice, but now it's wasted. Since Benning Terrace was built in 1958, the name Simple City was applied to the apartment building complex right after people moved in by people in DC and then the name stuck. My father who lived in Lincoln Heights as a teenager went into the military from high school in 1956 before Benning Terrace was built. When he came back four years later and was made aware of Benning Terrace he knew it as Simple City. He made the assumption the name referred to the silly people that he met there. He considered them simple-minded, and my uncles, his brothers, agree. My father told me the story of him taking a young lady home who lived in Simple City. She instructed him to go to her building in the circle. My father said he noticed men fist fighting in the circle with a large rowdy crowd surrounding them. There were people screaming and drinking. The women were as drunk as the men. It just looked like a total chaotic party. The bad part about the circle was that it was only one way in and one way out. He decided right then and there he can't date her anymore unless she moved. So let's look at some of the other slang terms from this article that they used. A boy named Sandy, nicknamed Fingers, a senior at Landon School for Boys said, People you don't like who are kind of square are onions. Or you can just say, he's a real loser. But in another part of town, this losing onion will be called a squirrel. In the 1950s, the term squirrel was making a comeback from the 1930s. In DC, the black teenagers were using terms that the white teens didn't understand, but were slowly learning. The greeting used by black teenagers, hey man, was started to combat white men calling all black males boy. Soon it spread nationally and became a common teenage greeting. Some of DC teen slang came from the black jazz musicians that would play on U Street Northwest in the clubs. Marianne Sensman, a 15 year old Northwood High School student, said in the article that the boys and girls around her way are greeted with, Well, what you say, man? In the romance department, a boy and girl are 20 20 if the feeling is mutual between them. Sandy Cohen, a 17-year-old High Point High School student, was explaining the sound the girls would make when a boy would walk by. It's sort of a love call. The closest the paper could come to explaining the sound in words would be, mmm, ah. If a teenager walked by without reacting, it is considered stuck up. He or she is a snookhead. Sandy also explained the police were called cops or the fuzz. But she said she heard the term fuzz from down southern Maryland and she brought it back up here and it caught on. As for the cars, there are various slang terms like hot rods, jalopies, 
heaps, buckets, growlers, or scorchers. To accelerate fast around the curve so the back of the car would slide sideways is to spin out, which is the evidence of the tire tracks on the ground. Teenagers would yell, Hawk that bad bomb when they want you to see a car that's going so fast nothing can catch it. And to hawk something is to look at it like a hawk. When it comes to food and drink, there were several names for a glass of water. A pine float is water with a toothpick in it. Or a glass of water with ice is H2O on the rocks. Or a plain glass of water is a hobo sundae. And a pair of salt and pepper shakers are called the twins. If you're drunk, you're stoned, wasted, or you're out of it. As for any clothing that you might have worn, they were called rags, no matter how stylish they were. And your shoes were called carts. As for money, there's multiple terms like skins, pounds, coins, bills, or bread. When leaving the room, you're ripping it up, or you can make like a tree and leave. Then there's the teen slang that was more like a joke when telling someone, hey, take it easy, greasy. You got a long way to slide. My father had slang for the girls in the family. Since there were more baby girls in the family, he'd say, hey, look at all these chicken heads. Because the girls would get together and start talking, all he'd hear was cluck, 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 cluck. All the kids in the family, he'd call little chickens. Now, all of us that's 50 years and older, he'd call us old hens. I went to Simple City to take pictures, and I was well aware that the black camera in my hands could possibly look like a weapon. So I purposely pointed up, just to let everyone know I'm taking pictures of the buildings. I didn't take pictures of people unless they gave me permission. While taking pictures of the buildings under renovation, I met a guy and asked his opinion of living in Simple City. And then I met an older woman and asked her the same thing. I promised not to take pictures of them or reveal any names. This is what they said. What? Dangerous. It's like... It's dangerous to live in Simple City? Today? Yeah, yeah, it's dangerous. Dangerous, ain't it? Yeah, it is dangerous. I was just coming from the store a couple weeks ago, and they shot about 40 times. How long you 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 live here in Simple City? I do. How long you lived here? What is it like to living years. here in Simple years. City? See, if you don't mind, cause last that long, you don't want to live in Simple City. You told me your car. I'm gonna be real. Mm. You don't want to live in Simple City. I'm gonna be real with you. You don't want to live here. It's no. How long you've lived here? I've been here. Uh, Since 2010. So 13 years. So, and this is not a good place to live. So are you gonna move somewhere else? I really wouldn't wanna move. I'ma mm -hmm. just keep it real with you. Uh -huh. I don't wanna move because right here where I'm at, in this section right here, it's beautiful. Yeah. And you got the train down the street. They shoot all over this place, but we don't, they never shoot right here. Mm. If I can stay here, I will stay here. The older woman said a whole lot more, and I listened for another 30 or so minutes, but she began to cry, and I also cried. I cried for her. I'll keep the rest of her conversation private. But she complained of her bad health, and I promised to bring her fresh food. Two days later, I bought her a bag of veggies and recommended that 
she make a homemade chicken soup. The glisten in her eye and the nod of her head let me know that she didn't remember who I was. She looked at me like the stranger that I was and looked at me as if she has never met me before. So I continued to let her think I was a random person who was giving away a random bag of vegetables. I want to thank Timothy Johnson and Jesse Ingram for sponsoring this video. If you want to support my channel, you can hit the PayPal button on my channel banner or hit the link on my About Me page. Or you can just send me a super thanks as your support. Like the video and subscribe to the channel. I'm Dickie D, your DC tour guide, and I will see you in the next video.